Okay, let's go and get started. Uh, today we're going to have a relatively short lecture. Uh, I'm going to talk about Lab 4 a little bit, uh, give a little bit of hint, uh, hints on that, and then I'm going to turn you loose on uh, having some time to work on that. So Lab 4, uh, let's go ahead and get started with what we're going to cover today. So Lab 4, you're going to have to write some functions, uh, some C language functions, that are going to modify strings that are passed to them. In other words, kind of like those standard functions like uh, string cat or whatever, they modify a, a string that's passed to them. We're going to do that with lab four. So let's take a quick look at the lab sheet. So I'm going to switch that over here. Give me one second and I'll switch the input so we can see that. Okay, so here's the lab sheet. And you'll notice what the lab sheet uh, says is that this is lab four, there's the due date. So for this lab, you're gonna be writing two programs. Program one, you're going to be writing this function uh, called uh, convert to leet speak. And what leet speak is, it's kind of a, a fun kind of transformation of words into something that supposedly like hackers use when they talk to each other. Uh, and people use this for passwords and things like that all the time. So, for example, uh, the pass or the phrase password might be represented in lead speak by changing the A with an at sign, the S with fives, the O with zero. So P at five five W zero R D, and the that kind of methodology. That's what lead speak is. So, what we're going to do for this lab is we're going to write a C language function called convert to lead speak. We're going to pass in a character pointer to some string to that. And it, that function is then going to go through all of the characters that are pointed to by that pointer, and it's going to convert them according to this. So the A becomes the at sign, a capital A becomes a 4, an S, uh, lowercase s becomes a 5, a capital S becomes a dollar sign, lowercase e or uppercase e become a 3, a lowercase l or uppercase l become a 1. Uh, lowercase o or capital O becomes zero, a b becomes a, lowercase b becomes a six, capital B becomes an eight, a z lowercase or uppercase becomes a two, and a t uh, that should say or, so a lowercase t or an uppercase t become a seven. So what you're going to do is you're going to write this function, and it's going to you're going to pass that pointer into it to that string. It's going to go through all of the characters of the string up to the null basically with some sort of, I'd use like a switch case, or you could use a bunch of if else's if you wanted to, switch case would be easier. But I would use that to say, if the character I got it, I'm on is an A, then replace it in the string, replace that uh, index in the string with this at sign, and then go to the next one. And you'll just go through the whole thing. Now, how do you know when you're at the end of the string? Well, there's gonna be a null at the end. So you're gonna have some sort of while loop that goes until you get to that null at the end, uh, doing the replacement of the characters according to this chart. Remember when you write your code, it should look like this. One thing that I want to point out uh, based on mistakes people made in the past is the convert to leet speak function should not print anything. There should be no printf inside of this function. So in other words, your main is going to allow the input of the message string. If you look back uh, a couple lectures ago about how to use uh, scanf, or you could look up how to do that uh, in a safe way using fgets, one of those two functions. Uh, but have the user so prompt them to type in a message. So you'd say, type in your message. And you type, hello world, this is my test program, period, enter. And then what would happen is that you're going to call this convert to leet speak function on the buffer that was filled in by them typing in their input. And then it's going to return. Uh, when it returns from that function, that string will now have been modified to lead speak, and then you're going to use the printf up here in main to print out the converted message string. So you can just say printf buffer or whatever, percent %s, use a percent %s for string, and then comma buffer here. So this should not print anything. This is just going to do a conversion and change the string as it goes through. And make sure your program compiles and executes without any warnings or errors. That also means you're going to want to have a function prototype for this function before the main. And that's it for program one. 
So program one, uh, there really shouldn't be much uh, difficulty in that, but note that we are modifying that string that's passed to this so that then when we print it out up here, you're gonna see it uh, turned into that lead speed. Now program two, we're gonna write something uh, does something similar, but rather than convert it to lead speak, we're gonna make this kind of encryption function it's called crypt. And what it does is it's gonna accept a character pointer to the message. So very similar to what we had up here. Notice here we had character pointer text, here we have character pointer message. And then we're also gonna pass in the length and we're gonna pass in a character uh, pointer to what we're calling the key. And I'm gonna actually kind of explain this a little bit, but the idea here is that the we're going to go through this message one character at a time, and what that message is going to do is going to uh, essentially go through and encrypt that message using XOR with the key string. And let me uh, uh, switch over to the document camera if I can. I don't know if it will let me or not. Uh, might need to pause here. OK, so it will let me switch to the document camera. So give me just a second to get a piece of paper, and then I'm going to explain how you're going to uh, encrypt this thing. So give me just a second here. Okay, we're back. Let me switch to the document camera. All right, so here we are on the document camera, and what I want to do is explain how this encryption is going to work. So let's say uh, we have a, we're going to have a message. Uh, so let me put the message up here. And that message uh, is going to be essentially whatever the user types in. So for example, let's say, say they type in H-E-L-L-O, and then this is a space, and then W-O-R-L-D, and then exclamation mark. And then because that's a string, the end of that string is going to have that null character at the end. So there's my end of string. Uh, indicator right there. Now the idea is we're going to encrypt that. We're going to ask the user to input a key as well. So here's going to be the key. And let's say our key, uh, since we're in October, uh, Halloween is coming up. Let's say our key is B O O exclamation mark. So essentially to perform uh, this encryption, what we want to do is go through and XOR this H, the character H, with the character B. And that's going to produce the result. So in other words, we're going to XOR these two characters together. And just as an aside, we'll, we'll do that for that uh, H and that cap, so that's a capital H and a capital B. Uh, let me switch over to, um, I don't know why the camera keeps losing focus. I might have to adjust that here. Hold on a second. Um, I'm going to pause again, uh, make an adjustment to that so it doesn't keep doing that. Okay, now the camera should not keep going out of focus and coming back. Um, hopefully, I believe I turned off autofocus on it. All right, so anyway, uh, we have this message, hello world, and we have this key down here. We want to XOR each of these characters. So the idea is H XORed with B. Well, what does that look like? So H. So there's a capital H. Uh, H, as it's stored in memory, uh, is 0x48. That's the binary bit pattern, which is actually looks like this. So a 4, think remembering back to how you convert hex, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 8, 1, 0, 0, 0. So there's what 4, 8 looks like in binary. And then the B that we're XORing that with is a 0x. Uh, 4, 2, and that looks like this, 0, 1, 0, 0, so there's our 4, and then 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, there's what 4, 2 looks like, and we're going to XOR those together. And if you remember the XOR operator is the little caret, 
So this XOR with that. Now, as a reminder of what XOR does, uh, XOR basically says if the two bits are different, then we get a one. If they're the same, we get a zero. So in other words, XOR is one or the other, but not both. So if we XOR these, so zero and zero is zero, zero and one is one, zero and zero, zero, one and zero is one. So different, same, 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 same. So here's what we end up getting out of that. We're going to get this value that's a zero, uh, what's that, a, 10 a. So zero a, zero x, zero a is what we get out of this. So x or those, zero x, zero a is what we get out of that. So the idea here with using this XOR as encryption is we go and do this with each of the characters here. So we did it with H, we did it with E, L, L. Here's our null on the end of that. But we're not going to do a null when we get to the end of this. We're going to, when we get to the end of the key, we reset back and start back with B again. So this is going to be B, O, O, exclamation mark, B, O, O, exclamation mark. And now when we're at the null of that, we're done. So in other words, we repeat the key over and over again and then get what the output of that is going to be. Now, one of the cool things about this XOR and the reason we're choosing XOR is when I XOR each of these symbols going across here, I'm going to get some thing that's going to change the result. So just like H and B produced this 0A, which is actually a new line character down here. So we H and B ended up being a new line character. E and O is going to produce some other results. So as we go across here, we're going to get a different value for each of these. So we've essentially turned hello world into some completely different string uh, that's going to result uh, as the output. And that's based on that XOR. Now, the reason we chose XOR for this is XOR, if we XOR again, so here's my result. If I take that and I XOR that, so let's call this result. If I XOR that with B again, so here's a B again, if I XOR that, well, 0x0a zero x zero XORed with B was 0x42, which was, again, 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Let's look at what happens when we XOR it with the key again. So let's look at what we get. So 0, 0, 0, different. So these are different, so we get a one. So same produces a zero. Same, here, move this up. Same produces a zero. Different produces a one. Same produces a zero. But what you'll notice we get back out of this, that this matches that. So in other words, if I XOR with B once, it makes a different pattern. If I XOR it with B again, it undoes what we just did and we get the thing back we started with. So now we're back to having an H again like that. So what's cool about this is if you run this program and you have your message that you put in, it's going to XOR that uh, with that key repeated and it's going to produce some new string. So we're actually modifying this string, just like the first part of the lab program one was modifying it into leet speak. This we're modifying it into a whole bunch of different characters, some of which will be printable, some which, which won't, some might be a null character. We don't really know. But if when we XOR it again, we should get back the original message that we started with. So let's go back to the lab sheet here uh, for a second. So back to the lab sheet. Notice what we're going to do in the main. You're going to allow them to input the message string. You're going to allow them to input a key string. We're going to then call uh, this function crypt with the pointer to the message, uh, the length of the key or the length of the message and a pointer to the key. And then we're going to print out what the encrypted message looks like. So essentially go through and print out one character at a time, all the characters in that message up to that length. And then we're going to call the crypt function again here. The same way we call it up there, we'll pass the same key, but now the message which has been changed is going to get passed in. And then we're going to have code that displays the results. So what you should see here, this should match what was input. This will be something totally uh, 
different than the input. So this is like a simple form of encryption. Um, it's actually uh, not too simple to decrypt. It's not a really strong version of encryption, uh, but it's it, it works okay. It's not easy to decrypt unless you have a fairly large text, uh, and then you can kind of crack it. But for the most part, uh, you're just going to go through. Now, how are you going to write the code in here to do that? Well, you got to go through every character of the message until are up to this length. So that's going to be a for loop that goes from zero up to uh, while we're while the condition is less than that. So for i equals zero, while i is less than length, i plus plus, what do we do inside of there? Uh, access this like an array, message subscript i equal message subscript i xor key subscript some value. And if the key ever gets to a, an index that is a null character, reset that counter back to zero. So this will go zero up to the null, back to zero, up to the null, back to zero, up to the null, until we're done going through the whole message. And so this is actually not a lot of code in here. We have a for loop that has uh, essentially modifying this message array. And the for loop goes up to that length and we have to manage the key so it goes, uh, in the case of boo, b, o, o, exclamation mark, Oh, we went to the null, reset back to the B, B O O exclamation mark, B O O exclamation mark. And so one of the things that I noticed that kind of uh, novice programmers would do here is they would try to like copy that string over and over again, like make boo and then uh, concatenate on the end of it, boo again and concatenate. And then you don't need to do that. Think about just indexing your array. We're at the B, we can go move ahead one space to the O, move ahead one space to the O, move ahead one space to the exclamation mark. Move ahead one space to the null. Uh-oh, I'm at the null. Reset back to zero. We're at index zero, index one, index two, index three. Index four is the null. Reset back to zero. So think about it like that. And this is not a lot of code. This is not a lot of code. Uh, so that's what you're going to be doing for this lab. But both of these functions are changing that key or changing this message in memory. And one question comes up is why do we have to pass the length of this in? Uh, why not just have it go up until the null? And the reason for that is that if I XOR a value with itself, uh, for example, if I had the, uh, let me switch back to document camera just for a second. If I'd gotten um, unlucky and had this message where this exclamation mark, and actually we have it right there, exclamation mark matches up with exclamation mark. Well, that's a value XORed with itself we'll get a zero out of that, which would be interpreted as a null. And then we would never be able to know the difference between that null and this null. And that could happen somewhere else too. For example, if my uh, uh, key was B O O O O exclamation mark, I'd have that O match up with this O, which would give me a null character. And then when I tried to encrypt it, decrypt it by calling crypt again, I'd get up to that and say, well, that's the end of the string, let's stop. So to get around that, what we've done in our lab sheet is uh, essentially pass the length of this in. Now, how are we going to get the length of that message? Uh, I would suggest using the string length function, strlen, because that will uh, get the length of that, and you can pass that into that function. Uh, I would actually save it off in a variable and then pass it into that function from that variable. So message length. Uh, message len variable equal str uh, the string length of the message, but calculate that outside here because when we call that function here, we have to pass the string length in. And then when we decrypt it again and call it again, we're going to want to pass that same string length thing in again. All right, so those are your hints. Uh, so go ahead and get started on that. I would start with program one first. It's a little bit easier. Uh, a little bit less going on, but it's also changing this text. Once you get this working, this one is going to be very similar. It's still changing the text that's in this uh, array that we're passing in. And one other thing is uh, would to allow the input for the message in the key, allow spaces and everything except the new line character. Uh, and again, uh, if you look at the previous uh, lecture where I talked about how to get input using scanf, uh, there's a good way to do that. Also make sure when you read that in that you size limit that to match your buffer. 
Uh, and go ahead and make the buffer like 100 characters big or something like that. Uh, we don't need to have a really large message uh, for these. Make the buffer statically allocated for something like 100 characters. But there's another uh, way, and that's using, to get it besides using scanf, there's another function called fgets that you might want to look at. Um, and if you just you Google uh, fgets. One quick thing, um, if you want to Google fgets or really any of these functions, uh, let me show you something here real quick. There's a thing uh, that was part of the original Unix system, and since C was made for Unix, there's a thing called man pages. And man stands for manual, so it's like a manual page. So every one of these functions that we've talked about in here has a manual uh, page for it. It's part of, if you're on a Unix-based system, you can just go to a command prompt and type man, or man f get s, and you'll get uh, the data that looks like this. It has a full description. This is like a web page that has all of these. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, it has what does the function look like, uh, what's the function prototype, there's fgets down there, and then it will have a description of it down here. And so you can look at that. So for example, uh, we want to look up, let's say, scanf man page. And there's the man page for, uh, for scanf. And this unfortunately has ads every time, but there's the man page for scanf. And it has a description of how it works down here along with the detailed uh, explanation for it. Again, uh, some people are still confused by printf and the format specifiers for that. So let's take a quick look at that. Printf man page. Oops. I had two f's there, but Google fixed it for me. So here's the printf, and you'll notice down, uh, as we scroll down through here, the format specifiers. will be uh, listed down here. Conversion specifier, decimal integers are D and I, uh, hex, X, and X, octal is O, unsigned is U, uh, characters are C. Uh, you could also Google uh, printf format specifiers and get a table of them. All right, so here's a whole table of them. Characters, decimal, integers, uh, octal, unsigned, uh, hexadecimal, uh, floating point, and, and uh, the kind of uh, exponent format, floating point, and the decimal format. And you can read through the rest of these S, percent s you're going to probably want to use in this uh, thing that you're working on now to print out the string. Okay, so let's switch back to the lab sheet here really quickly. Okay, so you, looking at the lab sheet, you're going to write two programs. The way I want you to submit those is you can uh, do that one of two ways. You can either submit them as uh, two separate C files. Uh, you or you could zip all of that up into one zip file that's called like lab four, uh, part A, part B, or whatever. Uh, but I basically need the C files uh, submitted. I noticed in a previous lab, people were submitting the project file uh, from Code Blocks. Uh, I would not suggest doing that. And here, let me show you why. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second. I'll be right back once I find Okay, so here's why you don't want to submit the, the project file. So let me switch over to uh, the display capture here. Okay, so here's uh, the display, and here's some project that I created in CodeBlocks. Here's the C file. If I were to actually open that, and let me just open that with Notepad. I'll just double click on it. Oops. Double click on that. So here is actual, the actual code. This is the source code. That's the file that you want to submit. If you want to, 
uh, you could zip up this entire thing inside of like lab 4a and submit that. But some people were submitting just this part, the CBP file, which is really the code blocks project file, but that does not include the source code. In fact, if I were to open this, and I'll open it with notepad plus plus, this is what's inside it. There's no source code. It basically says the name of the project, what compiler to use, uh, and then it has like what files need to be submitted, main dot, or what files are part of the project, main.c. But notice there's no source code in here. This is it. This is an XML file that basically just says, here's the, the compiler, this is the name of the project, and here's the source files that are in it. But the source file, the source code is not part of that project. So do, do not submit this file. You want to submit the C file. Or if you wanted to, you could zip up this whole thing and submit it. But really, there's no reason to do that. All I need is the source code. So I only need the uh, source files for your project. OK, so go ahead and uh, get to work on lab four. Uh, really, you should be able to get that done uh, today. It's not a lot of code. Uh, there might be some confusion. You might have to figure some things out. And I noticed that some of you, uh, your programming skills are a little bit rusty or lacking. Uh, and if you're struggling with this stuff, what I would suggest doing is try to go through the labs, get something working, uh, think about that. It also might help to look at some other C language uh, programs that are doing things. Go back and rewatch the, the lecture videos. Look at the programs that I post in those lectures and think about what it is that they're doing. Uh, we're going to have the midterm coming up uh, fairly soon. Um, and you're going to have to analyze some programs and say what the output is. Before the midterm, I will post a little study guide with some uh, test uh, sample kind of program analysis questions on there. Um, but I, really, if you're struggling with just program development, then you need to practice more. It's, uh, programming is learn, like learning how to speak a language. The more you do it, uh, the easier it'll get. So you need, you're going to need to spend some time. Uh, if you have questions or get stuck, ask me. Also, uh, there's an SI for this class, Chase, who is available. Uh, so you can uh, talk to him on Discord. Uh, but you, if you're struggling, if you're having difficulty with the labs, you need to get help and you need to make sure you're getting those labs done and you're understanding what we're doing here. If you have to watch the lectures two or three times, uh, if you have to go back and redo the labs you've already done, make sure you understand that. I noticed some of you on previous labs also went out on the internet and found a solution and just cut and pasted it in. If I see that you did that, you're not getting any credit for those labs. You need to write the code yourself. You need to understand what you've written because when it comes time for the midterm or the final, uh, those are going to be face to face. You're not going to be able to get on the internet and download whatever you want and submit it. You're not going to be able to get somebody else to do it for you. And really, the whole point of you taking this class is to learn this stuff because it's powerful stuff. The entire internet, uh, every game you've ever played, every operating system you've ever used, uh, every program you've ever uh, encountered has been written in C or C++ or touched C or C++ in some way. So you need to learn this stuff. It's powerful stuff to learn um, and understanding it in a uh, kind of a really, uh, I'd say, strong way is going to really help your uh, career and your understanding of a lot of different things. All right. Uh, let's go and stop there. Everybody stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Uh, stay away from strangers. Um, and next class, uh, we're going to talk about multidimensional arrays and how to pass those to functions, uh, how to receive those uh, into functions and then access the data in those. And then we're going to have another lab, lab five. And then the following week, uh, I'm going to announce the midterm and we're going to have some uh, kind of lab time and study guide. I might do that actually next class. I might announce that, but just start getting uh, the stuff done that you've done so far because we're coming up on the time for the midterm. All right, stay safe, and I'll talk to everybody soon. Let me know if you need help. Email me, send me a text message, send me a message on Discord.
I can always come in and sit down with you too. All right, see you soon.